probably helps if I'm uh, unmuted. Um, apologies for the, the uh, there's a rap battle going on next door. I'm in Detroit at the African Bead Museum. A lot of activities here on Sundays. Um, uh, this first slide here, uh, you can see a 900 year old Ethiopian church. Um, and if you look at the staircase here, uh, that is no ordinary staircase, right? Um, so you can see that the, the width of the staircase is getting shorter and shorter, sorry, width of the staircase is getting shorter and shorter as you go up, right? Um, and it's actually creating this logarithmic curve. So a really beautiful example of that uh, nonlinear tradition in Africa. Um, just wanted to get us started off uh, thinking a little bit about that. Okay, so in mathematics, I'm often presenting what I do to the National Science Foundation or somebody, um, and they'll say something like, oh, I get it. So you're trying to trick the kids into the STEM pipeline. Um, no, <laughs> the kids are not mice that I'm trying to trick into the maze, right? Culture is not the cheese, it's not the candy that I'm tempting these, these children with. That's the wrong way to think about STEM-based education. Um, and you see this in, in textbooks too. Um, you'll, you'll see folks saying, oh, you want to teach African-American kids. Let's bring in some origami because that's culture-based mathematics. And you can see the problem with that, right? Um, it, it's not paying attention to whose culture you're talking about. It's just sort of saying, well, if it's multicultural, therefore we've, we've solved the, the problem. Um, in some cases, uh, you're just swapping out the old word problems um, with brown skin and different names, but it's basically the, the, the same kind of arrangement. So that's not very satisfying either. So we have lots of examples of the wrong way uh, to teach STEM education with culture. Um, the funnel lesson plan, right? That you start out with, with some wonderful discussion but then you're trying to reduce everything to get down to this one math problem. That can also uh, 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 create some difficulties. So if you want to decolonize that pedagogy, you need an inverted funnel. You need expanded agency, um, not, uh, not diminishing agency. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about knowledge. So we can all agree that some knowledge is socially constructed like what's the best food? Um, I don't know, it depends on who you are, right? We all have different opinions of what the best food is. But some knowledge is factual, it's objective. So if I ask you to compare the densities of different liquids, um, I don't need to pull your opinion on it. I can just pour those liquids into a graduated cylinder like we've done here. And you don't even need a human being in the room. Those, those liquids will just sort themselves out with the lightest liquid on top and the densest liquid at the bottom. Um, so that's, that's obviously uh, a truth determined by the universe. That's not a matter of, of our subjective opinion. Knowledge systems combine both of those elements. So that's where it gets tricky. Um, and I'll give you here an example from um, the history of Euler's formula for polyhedra. So 1752, Euler proposes a relationship between vertices, edges, and faces. He says vertices minus edges plus faces always equals two, no matter which polyhedron you're talking about. Um, and everybody celebrates wonderful rule applies to all polyhedra until 1815 and Hessel comes along. And he says, what if I took a cube and I just hollowed out the inside space? Now, uh, those vertices, edges, and faces don't obey Euler's formula. So this math fight breaks out and they're arguing over it. And finally, Euler wins. They say, uh, we're gonna redefine polyhedra to be a surface covering uh, uh, pol polygonal faces. And that works until 1865 when Mobius, you guys know about the Mobius strip, right? Uh, Mobius comes along and he says, what if you took two pyramids and joined them just by one point at the vertex? Now it's only the surface um, <laughs> covering polyhedra and it doesn't obey Euler's formula. So a math fight breaks out and some people are for it, some people are against it. Um, 
And this goes on and on and on. It doesn't, it doesn't end there. So today we look at Euler's formula and we think Euler discovered a rule about the universe. But you can see it's just as much a social construction as it is a discovery in mathematics, right? Both as the social aspects and the objective aspects are combined together here. And I think about cultural evolution in the same way. At one point, there was a very small number of human beings in the world. There was only maybe 20,000 humans in the entire planet. Um, but as we spread out from Africa, those knowledge systems started to diverge, right? And obviously that's an oversimplification. There was all kinds of entanglement and trade and exchange. Um, but the point is there's no primitive knowledge. There's just branch points where they're diverged. But we're not taught to think of it that way. We're taught to think of it not as a, a branch, a bush, but as a pyramid. And that there's this European knowledge that's the highest, most, most uh, progressed, most civilized, and on down to uh, ancient empires, and below that would be indigenous societies, and so on. So uh, we need to sort of decolonize the way that we're thinking about knowledge systems. Western science in some ways becomes the gold standard by which we compare all other knowledge systems. And of course, it's going to appear as if it's superior and the others are inferior, if you're judging it by its own standards. But the um, rich uh, ecosystem of knowledge that exists in these indigenous cultures has a very different configuration. Um, it's very sophisticated in terms of its mathematical and computational aspects, um, but it won't match up. It won't map onto uh, the Western knowledge systems in that way. And as a result, Western knowledge becomes a kind of filter Right? So you've got this rich body of knowledge, but when you mask it by saying we're only going to count what we think of in the Western math classroom as mathematics, then suddenly you go, oh, well, I guess the, these primitive uh, indigenous people only have counting systems and some simple geometric shapes. And that's the extent of their mathematics. Now we might ask when exactly and why exactly did indigenous and Western knowledge diverge? What caused that divergence? And that's a matter of different economic systems. So if you look at uh, the pin factory, you know, when, when uh, Adam Smith wrote the, the, uh, the manifesto uh, for, for capitalism, the wealth of nations published in 1776, easy date to remember, um, he said the pin factory is the perfect example of why we need to de-skill employees. So each employee has some very, very simple task in the pin factory. I solder the head on the pin, or I cut the wire, or I sharpen the wire. Um, and by breaking it up into those little tiny uh, different tasks, you can hire a bum off the street. They don't need any training. And so you optimize. You can now pay people as little as possible. Um, and Adam Smith actually says in The Wealth of Nations that uh, in a um, population that's not expanding, um, we should have flat wages that are near starvation levels. <laughs> that's his, you know, the Bible of capitalism. Um, but you can see science technology paying attention to what the business people are saying and adopting those ideas. And so immediately people start specializing. Right, and technology comes out of this specialization. So as I de-skill labor, I have to have very specialized tools for those purposes. At the same time, the influence is going in the opposite direction. So when a physicist says, I want to look at how much uh, work is produced per energy unit expended, I'm going to call that the efficiency of the system. The business people, the economists hear that, they go, oh, well, that's just like in the factory, we want the most work out of workers for the least amount of money, right? And so you can see these ideas going in a feedback loop back and forth. So that divergence is a kind of positive feedback loop by which uh, 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 the, the, the twin efforts of capitalism and STEM co-evolve until we get to the point where when I was getting my master's degree in engineering, I heard the words optimization and efficiency every other sentence. 
right? It was like the, that was the only lens that the, the, the engineers could view the world through was the lens of optimization and efficiency as if nothing else matters. So this uh, extractive economy, this economy for pulling as much value as you can out of workers um, or pulling as much value as you can out of the farm, right? And giving back as little as possible um, that co-evolves with the forms of STEM that empower those kinds of economies. And we can see those results today. So we have um, extractive relationships with ecosystems that do strip mining, that do clear cutting of forests, that do overfishing of fish populations, that just pull out as much value as it can out of nature. So that's uh, extractive economy is causing all of these pollution problems. We have the same problem with labor. So we're extracting as much labor value as possible out of workers. We have the same problem with social systems, whether it's our online uh, uh, systems or uh, our real world physical systems. You have somebody uh, uh, like Zuckerberg saying, I'm gonna colonize your social networks. Your social networks used to belong to you. Now they're on Facebook. Now I own your social networks. They're, they're, they're my uh, 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 field of enterprise for putting out marketing or whatever I wanna do, right? So, so uh, Western uh, 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 knowledge systems branch just took a wrong turn at the extractive economy. And you might think, well, if we just get rid of capitalism, that'll solve the problem. But when you look at the textbooks that were used in the Soviet Union or in Cuba under Castro or in Eastern Europe, uh, when it was communist, you see the engineers using the same textbooks, talking about the same process of optimization. And they're, they're rhetorically going about it differently. They're saying, we need to optimize for the people's revolution, right? But because the revolution is from the top down and not the bottom up, the revolution is not self-organized. It's imposed by the communist party. Um, you end up with the same extractive economy, whether the profits are going to the, the Politburo and the communist state or the profits are going to corporations. It's all about extraction. But that's not the only way to do things. We don't have to extract value. Instead, we can circulate value. And uh, nature does this uh, in astounding ways. So whether you're talking about the tiniest possible scale, you're talking about biomolecules, and autocatalysis, or you're talking about a larger scale of a whole organism, or you're talking about an entire ecosystem, you always have that circular self-organizing system circulating value instead of extracting it and carrying it off somewhere else, right? Molecules are not wasted in your body. They become the ground for other molecules. Organisms become the adults that have babies that become adults that have more babies, right? Ecosystems self-repair. You get a, a forest fire in the ecosystem, come back in 10 years, you can't even tell there was a fire there. It self-organizes and self-repairs. So at every scale, this power of life is due to this recursive self-generation. Um, Schrodinger, the guy who gave us Schrodinger's cat, uh, wrote a little teeny tiny book uh, that most folks don't know about titled, What is Life? And he said, as a physicist, I wanna know what makes life break the second law of thermodynamics. How is life spontaneously ordering things instead of disordering. And he said, it's some kind of negative entropy, right? It's negentropy. It's, it's uh, the, the power to organize spontaneously from the bottom up instead of imposing order from the top down. And that is exactly how these fractal structures work in nature. Um, and it's the reason why we tend to see fractal structures in Africa. So if you look at these African villages, you can see circles within circles within circles, rectangles within rectangles within rectangles. And when I first started studying this, I just assumed, well, it must be like a termite mound or a coral reef, some kind of bottom up unconscious social dynamics that I'm seeing here. Um, and as I started to study it more, I became skeptical of that explanation, but it, it, it didn't really come to a head for me until I got to Africa. And I spent a whole year traveling around Africa, interviewing folks uh, on a Fulbright. Um, great job if you can get it, uh, and wrote the book, African Fractals, to document what I was finding, that this was not unconscious. These were actually algorithms. These were formula. These were recipes for how to create these kinds of structures. 
um, not just in architecture, but all the way down to the handheld artifacts, stacks of pots and uh, calabashes and things, um, sculptures, textiles, uh, uh, all kinds of, of fabrication methods that were done with this recursive loop. Um, that little staircase I was just showing you is a, a great example of the scaling sequence, right? And so, of course, as you walk to the church, you're walking to the power of life. Um, so they're taking that, that idea of Christianity, but they're, they're sort of reinterpreting it along the lines of this uh, African uh, uh, spiritual and knowledge system. Um, you'll see the snake biting its own tail uh, in some places in West Africa and Benin in particular. Um, this is the roof of that church in Ethiopia. Here we've got our uh, Ethiopian crosses and some textiles based on those. And of course, it doesn't stop at the borders of the African continent. So if you look at what happened um, in the, the, uh, uh, during the slave trade in the African diaspora, um, you can see those fractal traditions crossing the Atlantic, crossing the Middle Passage. And so you've got these wonderful examples of, for example, the, the G's Benz quilts, uh, or these uh, sculptors or jewelry makers, um, or hairstylists. You don't have to go to some exotic location, just walk down the street if you're in any big city in, in the United States and you can find somebody who's got a, a braiding shop doing these fantastic fractal traditions. So the basis for that recursive loop that you're seeing geometrically is this non-extractive economy um, that's happening through a, a kind of material infrastructure. Um, Gabriel Boache uh, is in this little village of Intonso in Ghana and uh, passed away uh, uh, just uh, a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, but you can see he's here uh, getting bark off a tree, uh, passing it on to someone who boils the bark in water. They strain out the bark and put that, after the, the, the pigment is taken out, they put that bark back into the sacred forest or into compost for farming. Um, and so in the sacred forest, you have monkeys and birds that eat all the fruits and carry it off to places like the place where the body tree grows that produces the bark. So the whole thing has a circular economy um, for the natural ecosystem, but it's also a sharing economy. And so you'll see that uh, in the case of labor value as well as being shared. So Western STEM was created for the purpose of value extraction. That is the, the core motivation uh, for the rise of science technology in the West. Whereas on the indigenous side, what you're seeing is what science and technology looks like if you were focused on value circulation, on not alienating the value from those who generate it. Now, the question is, um, does that create mathematics that didn't arise in Europe? Well, a great example of that might be the, uh, the Boilme symbol. Um, Emmanuel, I don't know if you can unmute quickly and, and pronounce that for us. Idea. Yeah, so there's a whole phrase there. Wow, may. Come in. Let's not check out the screen. Oh. Help me and let me help you. And you have indeed helped me. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. <laughs> I just I just call it the Boilme symbol, and I recommend if you're teaching a math class, you do the same. Um, so so you you can you can see here we've got two triangles, and so often when I ask teachers what do you see, they'll say, "Oh, that's reflection symmetry," but it's not reflection symmetry, right? So so um, you've got a, a hole here a square shaped hole, and you've got a hole here, a round shaped hole. And this triangle up here has an extra circle. And this triangle down here has an extra square. So the other person has what you need and you have what the other person needs, right? Now in the West, when you introduce mathematics to kids, you often say, well, I'm gonna give you some candy worth 10 cents and so you're going to give me two nickels because every exchange has to be even. But in Africa, gift economies are not based on the idea of an even exchange. They're based on the dynamic of a continuing exchange. 
right? I am always in your debt and you are always in my debt. So and rather than jumping to reflection symmetry and the end of the conversation, you always want that conversation to be ongoing. And if you've ever traveled in Africa, the first thing that happens in the market is they're not going to tell you the price. They're going to uh, bring you into a negotiation, right? It's going to be a conversation. And often when I was in Senegal, I would go down to the market trying to buy, I don't know, some screw or something. Um, and we'd go, <laughs> go into this negotiation. And at the end of it, um, you know, we'd finally sell on a price. And then before I leave, the guy says, oh, and I'll give you a bonus screw just to be your friend. <laughs> so yeah, there was no efficiency there. There was no optimization. There was just an invitation to a relationship, right? It's a relational economy, different, different set of mathematics. If you look at these uh, traditional artifacts, um, you can see that they take a really long time. Nobody was trying to be efficient when they created uh, cornrow braiding and micro braids. Nobody was trying to be efficient when they created uh, Native American seed beads and you, you spent you know, three hours making a little teeny tiny triangle. They were doing the opposite. They were trying to see how visible can I make my labor? Not let me disguise the exploitation that my workers are undergoing, right? In the, in the West, we're co constantly trying to cover it up, making sure that nobody can see what's really going on behind the scenes. In the indigenous context, you wanna do the opposite. You want so somebody to see the labor that went into these products. So you wonder why do I get these fantastic fractal shapes uh, in these beaded belts? It's because I want you to see the work that went into it, right? Um, you, you get your, your hair done and you say, look at the love my friend showed me. She spent three hours on my hair. It's a relational economy. So it's producing a whole different set of, of geometries and, and different priorities about what it is you want to do with that geometry. Um, wonderful discussion we had on the Lusona drawings earlier. Somebody right off the bat said, hey, wait a minute, isn't that uh, fractal? Um, well, it could be. So uh, in some places, you'll see Lus uh, reports of Lusona that were done in an age grade initiation. And so the youngest kids would do this version of the algorithm. And the next older would do this version. And the next older would do this version, right? Um, so if, if, we go to that, uh, if we go to that link right there, and I think I've got it set up here. So, so here's the actual algorithm. Um, and you can, you can think about it as a box of mirrors. And if you said angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, that's all you need to know. A, a mirror shot at that 45 degree angle will automatically create that entire Lusona. And of course, as you uh, widen the bounding box, you'll uh, get different iterations of that algorithm. So, so we want to we want to ask the question, um, not just what math do we see in this, right? But in the original context, what functions did it serve? And it served the function of marking that moment in your life when you were going to have a new iteration, right? This is a new part of your life. You're now reborn um, as a young adult, or you're reborn. You've gone from being a baby to being. Uh, an adolescent. And so there's certain responsibilities you need to know. And here's the story that comes with that responsibility. And that's what these things do is they illustrate those, those stories. So you can see that convergence, that integration between the recursive geometry and the structuring of these uh, societies to do different kinds of social work. Um, and it's not just in Africa. You'll see this in indigenous societies uh, done in very different ways. I don't want to re reduce it to one thing. Right. So uh, in, in Native American societies, you don't see fractals. Um, what you see instead is stochastic variation. You see the trickster. You see the, 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 the variation of, of nature done randomly, not done recursively. Um, but this serves a particular purpose. So I get my sheep going out there grazing. The sheep come back to the corral. And what do they do? They poop and they poop out seeds from all those plants all over the reservation. And so when botanists examine the plants around the corral, they're astounded at the biodiversity, right? Um, what advantage does that have for weavers? 
it gives you a dye diversity. It gives you color diversity. And so you're integrating um, that high entropy uh, factor into your, your weaving and your rugs. Um, and then of course the profits go back and they uh, 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 bring uh, um, value back to the sheep again. So it's also a circular economy, um, not because it's producing fractals, but because it's circulating the value uh, through a different, a different process. Now, if you look at the loom and you see somebody weaving up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, you might think that's a 45 degree angle. Um, but if you measure it with a protractor, you'll see it's about 30 degrees. It is not a 45 degree angle. Can anybody solve that dilemma? Up one over one, up one over one, up one over one, but it's not 45 degrees. I'd worry about the silence, but there's actually a throbbing bass in my ears from that rap party next door. Well, you know, my uh, my wondering would be, you know, the way that the the loom is shaped, you know, if you're thinking up one over one, you're thinking lines are crossing at a 90 degree, you know, the lines on like a coordinate grid are crossing at 90 degree angles. And I'm wondering maybe the way that the lines are on the loom are not 90 degree angles. That's no, that's a that's a brilliant idea. And I bet if we look long enough, we could find a culture of which that that is true. But it's not true for the Navajo. You're you're really close, though. You're really close. There's something about their grid that's different than the Cartesian grid. There's some comments in the chat uh, that the length unit is longer than the width unit. That is exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it has to be really, really strong on the warp and the weft is from the sheep. And so it's this very soft wool. Um, and, and so it's, it's, and they tamp it down, they compress it, right? Um, so I, as you can imagine, they've got plenty of algorithms, but they're not, they don't map on one-to-one -to, -one to the Euclidean algorithm. It's just a whole nother set. Uh, and I interviewed one weaver and she, she said that um, her mom had this really complex weave and wouldn't tell her what it was unless she paid her. And she knew her, her mom was going to spend the money on junk food. So she didn't want to pay mom. So she reverse engineered it. She said she figured out the, the algorithm by, by analyzing it. So, so in the Native American case, you've got uh, genetic diversity in crops. Um, gambling and games of chance is a huge thing. Uh, in Native American culture. You've got uh, divination that goes by random movements and trickster stories uh, using random events. Um, and so that has a different mathematical basis. Um, but the trickster here is representing the uh, 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 uncertainty of nature. Nature gives you a flood one year, it gives you a famine the next year, and then it gives you a drought, then it gives you a pestilence. How are you gonna keep up with the variety of conditions that nature throws at you by having an equally diverse variety of crops. And so that's why when Europeans came to the new world, it blew their mind. They were things they had never heard of. There were tomatoes, there was something called a potato, there was cassava, peanuts, peppers, avocado, sweet potato, tobacco, pumpkin, squash, pineapple, chocolate, vanilla, um, if you think about Europeans, uh, rubber came from the New World. Rubber revolutionized industry, right? Um, uh, quinine that allowed folks uh, to avoid the worst symptoms of malaria and travel around the world came from the New World. So because of that trickster-based uh, 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 calculation and thinking and emphasis on biodiversity, um, uh, Europe benefited greatly from these amazing innovations that we never give Native Americans credit for. All right, so we, we set up our website, uh, Culturally Situated Design Tools, and I, I welcome you guys to peruse the, the website um, and just look over the, the variety of tools. Each one of them has um, some background 
where we tell students, uh, we first introduce the cultural basis. So how did cornrows uh, uh, get invented? You know, when I, when I first asked uh, students in, in New York, they all said Brooklyn. No, <laughs> nobody said Africa. So I, that's when I realized, man, we really need that cultural background. Um, so we, we, we tell a little story. You've got a, a little cultural background and you can just ask the kids, you know, just read through this and tell us what you thought, what struck you as the most interesting part about this, right? Um, and then uh, 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 there's tutorials. So, so leading the kids through using those scripting tools. Um, and then finally, some things uh, that direct them towards the, the particular kinds of mathematics or fabrication activities we wanna do. Um, but it's always a challenge because there, there's always that sense that, well, if I really make it as relevant as possible to school, aren't I just in the service of hegemony, right? Um, and so we're, we're constantly trying to, to come up with strategies to sort of resist that at the same time that we make it as useful as possible to the kids and the, and the teachers. Um, this is my wife, Audrey Bennett, um, interviewing uh, one of our artisans uh, we work with here in Detroit. Uh, Carol Harris, um, she does these beautiful geometric quilts um, that are inspired uh, by jazz and spontaneity. Um, so at first you might think, well, wait a minute. So uh, if they're spontaneous, there can't be any math in it, but that's not at all true. If you listen to jazz, you can hear, right? There's an order underlying this, the, the spontaneity. Um, so catching on to some of that, we started to realize we needed to open up the design tools a lot more. Um, and so we're, we're, we're now making available libraries of images. So they start with um, a particular set of tools. They're gonna maybe do the G's Benz quilts or uh, Anishinaabe quilting traditions. Um, but then there's a library of images they can open up and they can use you know, any image they want or they can grab one off the internet. Um, so we really stress uh, uh, once, once we've, we've sort of um, made sure folks understand the heritage algorithm as we call it, um, then we stress opening up the agency for the kids and making sure that their creative sensibilities can be applied in whatever way um, they want to. So really what we want to do is not extractive STEM education that says let's diversify the input to the pipeline, but make these kids of service to these giant corporations that are destroying the world, but rather generative STEM, right? We want the STEM to cycle back to the communities and the products to be of, of value to the communities. And that too can really draw in kids and, and help motivate them. Um, so here we have uh, one of uh, my grad students who's now a professor, Michael Latchney, uh, interviewing a braider in upstate New York. Um, the kids uh, uh, producing some designs out of that. Um, we work with the kids to 3D print these onto uh, mannequin heads. And then those go back into the braiding shops. Um, as a result of that, the braiders started to say, hey, we want to be involved too, right? It shouldn't be just education for kids. Um, so we held some workshops for the adults and we asked them, you know, what, what kinds of, of STEM challenges might we address? And they all immediately said pH. We're constantly using hair products that are damaging. Um, so we started introducing these pH meters. Um, we uh, hired some of the students to work as interns to work with the adults. So you get that intergenerational uh, uh, conversations going. Um, and um, one of the students ended up um, creating her own store and, and selling her own uh, pH neutral products. And we've, we've got some other adults who have gotten involved and uh, taken it in different directions. Um, this is an example with a Native American group we worked with. Um, they had used the virtual bead loom, which is probably the most popular thing we've, we've done with math teachers. Um, but they said, you know, we've, we've got a lot of things that, that have that look, that sort of algorithmic look in our 3D structures. Can you make some 3D software for us? So we interviewed the elders who are still making these, these artifacts the traditional way um, and embedded that knowledge and those algorithms into that design tool. Um, so here you can see one of the students creating the ribs of a canoe using this, this little iterative um, sequence. Um, and then I started wondering, well, we're modeling this as parabolic curves because that's what the math teachers could relate to for math class. But I don't know if these things are actually parabolas. Let me investigate this a little bit more. And I realized, no, those are Bezier curves. And I know that's not part of the K-12 curriculum, but let me just see where this leads to, right? Who was Bezier? 
So it turns out that Bezier worked at these French automobile companies in the 1950s. And you might remember the Citron, uh, the, those you know space cars of the future in the 1950s, those beautiful sinuous curves they had. Um, that was produced by these uh, taking pieces of wood and bending them, right? Um, and then Bezier, uh, his job was to model this. When they interviewed Bezier, um, he said, well, um, you know, this was my idea, right? I, I deserve the, the patent and the copyright on this. I interviewed Native Americans and they all said the wood taught us. So there you see the difference between the way the Western culture is approaching it is my property rights. You know, one individual has to get the credit for this versus somebody who says it's not only intergenerational, it's interspecies, right? We're sharing uh, our, our human people knowledge with the wood people or the salmon people, right? The rest of the, of the, of the agencies in that, that ecosystem. Um, but it's the same family of curves. It's just the, who gets the, the credit for it. Um, and here you can see the Native American students doing this work. Um, when I uh, was working with the Native American students, they kept bringing up greenhouses. And so we started doing some of these uh, aquaponics workshops um, with them. And as a result, uh, here in Detroit, um, we ended up creating an Afrofuturist greenhouse. And if we have time, I'll, I'll show you that in the, the end slides. I think I'm just about done, um, but I'm probably also just about out of, out of time here. I have two minutes left, two hours. Somebody speak up. <laughs> what do you say, uh, Cogba? About 10 more minutes. 10 minutes, OK. All right. Um, so you, you just missed uh, Kwame Robinson. Um, so I have some graduate students working for me. One of them happens to be a fanatic um, for artificial intelligence. Um, and I, I told Kwame, you know, here's the challenge. Um, I don't want AI that makes Elon Musk uh, wealthier than he already is or, or creates, you know, more billions for, for uh, Zuckerberg. I want AI that benefits the grassroots. And so one of the problems I've seen in Ghana is when I watch tourists in the market, they can't tell the difference between factory made kente cloth and hand woven kente cloth. And so they're undermining the market for hand woven because it takes a long time to produce that, right? I want you to give me a cell phone app that can tell the difference between the two. Um, so we've, we've published this, you've got the, the link down there at the bottom. Um, and Kwame was just here this morning working with our high school students. So he's now developed uh, an, an uh, AI uh, uh, training as part of the CSDT website. Um, I'll show you that if we have time at the very end. Um, this is a group of uh, artisans that um, we got a small grant to help them start some online marketing for what they're doing. Um, and so AfricanFuturist.org uh, is their website. They own the website. We, we've just helped them build it and you know, get things uh, set up. But we shipped some uh, laser cutters to them. And so this particular group has the uh, old school, you know, auntie and, and grandma um, have their old sewing machines. The younger uh, students have their laser cutter and so they're working together now to create these beautiful shirts uh, that you can buy for a pretty good price, um, I think. Um, I've been talking lately with a lot of folks about what it means to really decolonize STEM. Um, and often you'll see advertisements for a software developer, it will say full stack developer, meaning somebody who could work at the interface, but also on the server side, right? Um, so I, I like to use this uh, uh, phrase from Jason Lewis, full stack decolonization. We, we want that decolonization at the level of the work you're doing that has to be pleasurable and, and, and meaningful, right? And purposeful um, and sustainable. But we also want it at the level of the economic ecosystem. So how are these different groups uh, uh, getting sources from each other? How do you link supply chains together? How do you get more generative consumption, not just more generative production? Um, and and um, fortunately, the National Science Foundation just, just gave us a, a big grant for this. And, and, and so we're, we're going to try to find out. Um, so this is a little uh, diagram we set up for this vision for how it might work in, in Ghana. Um, but I think I've got one more slide here. Ah, it's not showing up. Um, I was going to try to show my last slide there of the um, uh, uh, the African Futurist Greenhouse. Actually, you know, I think I've got that here. Yeah, 
Um, so, so here I am working with Dobbles, who owns the Bead Museum. Um, here's some of the examples in Africa, the 3D structure for the greenhouse, um, a group of local teens and uh, university students working together on this. Uh, there's the roof. Um, and here's our, uh, we've got our, our 3D printed model that just kind of helped guide folks who didn't have any, you know, uh, uh, engineering experience. They're just lay people. Uh, but it, it really helped having that hands-on model that they could use. And uh, one of our graduate students now working on these um, Zulu beads that are made from Job's tears. So uh, she'll be helping us grow those in the greenhouse, and then those will get sold uh, at the uh, at the the uh, the bead gallery uh, up here, which is what this place is all about. Um, so I'll, I will end there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that just enlightening conversation. I don't, I, I can't think of uh, anybody in the room who didn't learn something that they didn't know before from that presentation. That was that was amazing. Um, so I'd like to, I guess, uh, Cogba, we have a few minutes for some Q and A. Yes, if uh, Dr. Iglesias would be so kind, uh, that would be great. Uh, so if you have a question that you would like to pose, you can post something in the chat or you can unmute and ask a question. I'll ask a question. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Eglish, I want to say thank you for your book, African Fractals. I used it with my dissertation um, on the relationship between culture and uh, ethnomathematics, teaching mathematics for higher education, community college students underrepresented. So and it was fabulous. Learned a lot, Paul uh, Gerda's work and everything that you re, um, mentioned as well. So I, I wanted to know, because I know early on when I was looking at your book and your research, you had one version of your website that, that had some of the pictures that you have here. And then I know that, that was taken down. So were some of those older, um, with uh, like the hip hop and things like that, you had some uh, imagery and things like that. Is that going to be available on your on the website that you just cited? Because I know the last time I looked, it wasn't there. Um, I can't imagine what got taken down. So so uh, we've got um, two different ways of looking at it. The National Science Foundation rejected my grant proposal. They said this doesn't look like it's focused on computing. You keep talking about mathematics. So I said, fine, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have the front page just about computing. So you'll notice it's here, it says discrete iteration, and then next it says continuous paths, and then next it, it says 3D, and then next it says recursion, next it says hardware, um, and here's our AI and, and gaming. So that was all to make the computer scientists happy. But originally the way I had it was a focus on culture. Um, and so these are across cultures. So quilting, of course, is in many different cultures. So we've got our, our G's bins quilting here. Um, and we've got our, um, oh, I don't know if, uh, do I have sound enabled here? There we go. Um, so, so here um, uh, you can- <laughs> So here you can get into the way that some of the uh, visual patterns are reflecting uh, sonic patterns, right? Um, but that was that was just for G's bends. There's also uh, Appalachian quilts. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not pushing white kids into the Proud Boys or some kind of neo-Nazi movement, right? So get that get them uh, energized and feeling like they're part of the uh, part of the effort. Um, so we've we've found these uh, the radical rows, the abolitionist symbol. Um, in these Appalachian quilts, you would think that's, you know, all redneck country, and, and now it is, but back in the uh, uh, time before the Civil War, it was not. It was a hotbed of abolitionist uh, activism. So really, you know, you can see the, the uh, uh, white kids uh, kind of opening their eyes to some of this stuff. And of course, uh, Anishinaabe and so on. Um, but we also have an Afrofuturism section. So I, I contacted uh, Sally Kane, Senegalese 
textile artist and she gave us permission um, to use these uh, designs from her work. Um, Ruth Carter uh, was the designer for the uh, Black Panther movie, costume designer. Um, and so she talks in this video clip uh, about what she did and you've got a little matchup here. So I can, I can try to figure out, you know, where, where exactly uh, did this thing come from? Ah, oh, it came from there. Um, where's Angela Bassett's headdress come? Um, so we did, we did the same thing with hip hop. If you go to Corno Curves and you look at grades three to five, um, you can see we've, we've got all the, uh, uh, the hip hop connections there just because we wanted something that was kind of fun and light uh, and for the younger kids to just immediately, you know, start interacting with this stuff. They don't want to read, they want to click on things. Um, and, and so you need, you need that, that kind of, of interaction and, and playfulness. Um, so we definitely have the, the hip hop connections there. Um, we've got it in, if you look under culture and you look at African-American, um, you'll see uh, barbershop computing. Um, so there's, there's a lot there uh, on that side of hip hop. Um, if you look under across cultures, uh, you'll see graffiti. Um, so a lot of hip hop going on there. So there's, there's plenty of places where uh, that contemporary, uh, uh, those contemporary interests and, and the, the um, uh, mathematical uh, simulations intersect. Great, can we have that link, um, the URL in the, in the chat, please? Absolutely, so it's just csdt.org. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, so Mickey had a question. What even got you interested in this inquiry in the first place? Yeah, so, so um, uh, in uh, high school, I read uh, uh, Norbert Weiner's book, The Human Use of Human Beings on Cybernetics. Um, and I was pretty impressed that he had a social justice edge to him. Um, you know, I grew up in California during the 60s, um, but he was also a mathematician, right? Um, in fact, his biography is titled, I am a mathematician. So, so here's somebody who was combining the two. And so I majored in cybernetics when I was an undergrad at UCLA. Um, and there was no grad in cybernetics. So I majored in systems engineering. That was the closest thing I could find. Um, but then when I got to uh, my PhD, I wanted to kind of go over to the other side, right? And um, so I went to the history of consciousness program at Santa Cruz. Uh, Huey Newton got his, his, his degree there. Angela Davis was teaching there. Uh, Bell Hooks came through there briefly as a lecturer. Um, Donna Haraway was, was my doctoral advisor. Um, so it was, it was definitely a look at the other side, right? Um, but when I would ask folks about, you know, uh, 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 how can we bring mathematics to bear here? They would say, oh, math is the tool of white capitalist patriarchy. I mean, it was just a very, you know, negative reaction to that. Um, so out of desperation, I thought, well, let me look at the, the uh, uh, developing world technology stuff, right? Because you've got to be talking about culture and technology there if you're talking about how to bring, I don't know, tractors to Bot Botswana or something. Um, so I just kind of stumbled across this paper by, by a, a, an anthropologist who said that in Tanzania, the village she was looking at um, had this wonderful autonomy for women. If um, women wanted to uh, divorce their husband, they could just move into their own house. If their kids were getting on their nerves, they would build a separate house for the teenagers. Um, In-laws, same thing. Because the indigenous housing was so cheap and quick and there was usufructory rights to the land, um, women had this a, a wonderful autonomy that was based on the architecture. But um, Ujamaa, the, the modernization program was coming in and making everything into concrete blockhouses because that was you know, efficiency and optimization and modernization, right? Um, so she said she was worried that women's autonomy was going to be lost in this effort. So I wrote to her, this is before the internet, and, and I said, you know, I get the concrete blockhouses, that's the Cartesian grid, but what was the geometry back when it was just self-organized and people were building their houses wherever they wanted to? Um, and she said, well, I got some aerial photographs, here they are. And I was staring at those going, huh, those look kind of like fractals. So that's how the whole thing got 
started. It was it was just uh, by chance. Um, but once I got the bug, you know, I, I started looking at indigenous architecture, aerial views of, of uh, South Pacific and, and uh, South America, only the African ones were fractal. And that's when I realized, okay, it can't just be unconscious bottom up dynamics. There's some knowledge that's specific to Africa that I'm not going to find in these other places. And fortunately, the, the uh, Fulbright folks went for it and, and gave me that uh, uh, Fulbright scholarship to just travel around Africa, interviewing folks about fractals for a year. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to uh, to Dr. Kagba. All right. Uh, may, do, may we have time for one more question in case anyone else uh, has a question? Um, so any 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 questions for Dr. Edgar? This is fascinating. In oh, the go ahead. chat, there's a, a question in the chat at the bottom there. Okay. All right. So it says uh, you mentioned in your TED talk at the end that mathematics binary zero one came out of Africa. Can you elaborate? From Dr. Yeah. T yeah. Um, so so um, if you if you uh, look at the origins of the of the binary code, um, you can see uh, that that book uh, Decombinatoria on combinatorics, right? Um, first uh, 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 brings in the um, uh, uh, divination system, the African divination system. Um, of, co of course, he didn't, he, uh, Leibniz didn't know it at the time. Um, he just said, this is called geomancy and it's used by these alchemists and they don't know what they're doing because they're not mathematicians, but I know, you know, and I can analyze this um, and, and it's uh, uh, use, using powers of two. Um, so, so uh, later on, he, he writes a paper where he introduces for the first time the, the binary code. Um, so there's a, there's a pretty clear sequence between his PhD dissertation, Decombinatoria, um, where he talks specifically about that African uh, uh, divination system, geomancy. But it's, it's, a, it's a little bit tricky because he doesn't call it an African system. He just calls it geomancy. You have to go back and look at where geomancy came from. Um, and the, the, the history is pretty specific. So, so uh, Raymond Lull, with this weird uh, uh, spelling of two L's, um, is the, sp the Spanish uh, philosopher who, who first uh, uh, takes it from these Muslim uh, mystics who brought it from North Africa into Spain. Um, so the history of it is very well documented. It's just that, that Leibniz didn't know it. Um, uh, and, and likewise, you know, moving forward, everybody attributes uh, the binary code to Leibniz, but nobody thinks about the fact that he was writing about geomancy as the powers of two before he introduced the binary code. So you, you have to sort of supply the, the missing links, but that's the, that's the sequence. Thank you, Dr. Glass. And, and, and one I last question. Uh, is when you did the Fulbright, did you already know what you wanted to study? Yeah, so so I had uh, looked at these aerial photographs of African villages and thought, wow, that's such an amazing, perfect fractal. Um, but I could not find any anthropologist who was bringing up that fact, right? And you have to remember fractal geometry, the word fractal didn't get invented until 1977. Um, and I was, I was doing this in... Uh, Let's see. Uh, uh, Ninety-two uh, was when it was when I made that trip. Um, so, 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 uh, of course, the anthropologists, you know, weren't paying attention to some um, obscure uh, uh, corner of the mathematics world. Not, not very surprising. Um, but visually, I could see that there was a clear scaling structure there, right? Um, so it was it was quite a chore to sort of walk into a a, a village. And say, hey, I saw this. You know, here's an aerial photograph of your village, and uh, of course, everybody's like, a what? You know, they didn't know what an aerial photograph was. Um, it was a long conversation, um, but that was good. It, it gave me a chance to to say, here's why I'm asking these questions. You know, here's here's what would be so amazingly profound um, if I can just understand what it is you guys are are doing. Um, and that was just so wonderful 
to have folks recognize that, right? So they would, they would be a little suspicious. They would say, you know, who, who the heck are you? Are, are you some kind of missionary here to convert us? You know, are you some do-gooder Peace Corps volunteer? What's going on? And I would say, no, I think you guys have an amazing mathematics. Let me explain that to you. And there would just be, you know, a lot of enthusiasm. People would immediately get it, right? Um, and they knew they had heard of Sheikh Atta Diop and this idea that um, uh, ancient Egypt was black. Um, but in sub-Saharan Africa, that was not playing very well. People, people were like, well, okay, you know, maybe the Egyptians did all that stuff, but that's not us. Um, and, and uh, uh, I think Malefi Asante's idea that Egypt gave the rest of Africa stuff was not what they wanted to hear. They wanted it homegrown. And, and so being able to, to say, you know, now that you've explained to me the self-organizing origins of your thinking about this architecture, that it's a symbolic representation. If you've ever read the, the, the Dogon uh, cosmologies, for example, um, the, the recursion in there is just mind blowing. Um, and I was going to say, even for something as simple as the Lusona, you know, if you look at those recursive uh, algorithms, there, those are not the same algorithm each time, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we can see the relationship between them, and so can they. And so the elders must have some higher order meta algorithm for producing algorithms. And, and you know, there's just worlds of research to be done. Um, along that vein, if we can if we can get folks understanding that that that's a, a potential direction here. Uh, I'm sorry, there was one last uh, uh, comment in chat. Oh, how colonization impacted thoughts and ideologies? Yeah, you know, it's it's always this sense of we want to prove that we're just like Europe, right? And so taking this other direction and saying, well, how about what what differentiates Africa from Europe and the value of of, of that in in taking us in a a completely different direction and, and pre, completely different realm of possibilities. Um, that's what would just seem so profound to me about it. Well, let's let's give a, a big hand to our speaker for today, Dr. Aglash. This was amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Aglash, and thank you all for uh, showing up here today. Uh, we know you could have been doing a lot of things on this Saturday in Southern California. It's a beautiful day outside, so make sure you catch some sun. Uh, and it looks like there's some sun rays over there in uh, Detroit as well, in Michigan. Uh, and uh, Dr. Igalash, if you uh, if you want, you can drop a bar or two here, uh, or you can go ahead and you know, throw, your third, throw your head into the battle next door. <laughs> but thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and, and just this wonderful knowledge you, you gave us. And uh, you know, in the tradition of everything you told us, you've, you've spoken to us, I think we are all excited to uh, continue uh, to spread this knowledge and spread um, the self-empowerment to our students as we uh, go forth our, our different ways. So thank you all for showing up today. We will see you again next month. Take care. Thank you. That was so good. That was Amazing. That was wow. awesome. Yeah. Off the day. Off the day. That was rich. That was dope. Yes. Yeah. So how do we yeah. get a copy of the recording? Uh, you know what? I am recording it, so I will you probably stop it. Yeah, because that you gotta go back and like be like, oh, I missed that part. That yeah. was good. That was, that was awesome. rich. Yeah. yeah. Thank that you. That was great.